Hello, this is Dr. Ahmed Abdelal, and today we're going to speak about voice disorders. Uh, this is meant to be a survey. It is meant to be an overview and for students who are studying intro to communication disorders. When you go to grad school in speech language pathology, you're going to have a complete graduate course discussing voice disorders. So here, the purpose is to give you a quick introduction about these disorders. So we'll speak about the mechanics of, uh, mechanics of how to generate voice and the process of phonation. And we'll speak about um, some disorders, the major uh, categories of voice disorders, how to evaluate them and how to treat them. Of course, we'll speak about um, briefly about some of the major uh, therapy techniques. So the system that is dedicated, that is responsible for generating voice is the larynx. And the larynx is made out of cartilages, a number of cartilages, and they have a lot of muscles surrounding the, um, attaching to these cartilages. The larynx is, um, is uh, can, some of the muscles connecting to the larynx are called uh, extrinsic and some are called intrinsic. The extrinsic ones uh, insert onto the larynx and they have, some of them have connections below, like for example, on the, on the sternum or the breast, or the breast bone here and some of the even the collar bone there are muscles that arise from here and go up and attach to the um, to the larynx so they hold it from below and some muscles um, originate above the larynx come down and insert onto it and they suspend it from above so that it is stable inside of the neck but then so when you swallow you notice that your larynx goes up for example that is because of these extrinsic muscles. Some of the muscles are called intrinsic. That means they are both the origin and the insertion are inside of the larynx or on the larynx somewhere. So these are the, the intrinsic muscles are responsible for generating that voice directly. The larynx sits on top of the trachea and the larynx houses the vocal folds. So here's the larynx. The vocal folds will be like this, sitting inside of the larynx and they are V-shaped. The in front area, this is the front where the vocal folds originate and then they go, each one goes back and connects onto one little cartilage called the arytenoid. That cartilage, when it rotates, it is rotated by intrinsic muscles that will pull, tug on it and, and then it will rotate that, that um, cartilage inward. And when it goes around inward, it brings that vocal fold that is attached to it. It brings it closer to the midline like here or here. And the same one, the other one will do the same. So in this uh, position, we call it the adducted position. So adduction means closure of the vocal folds. Abduction is the opening of the arytenoids, the opening of the vocal folds of them. So the ad, um, abduction is the normal, normal position for the vocal folds to be in, in most of the time. When you are breathing, we are, um, when you are sleeping and so on, Whenever you are not swallowing or um, speaking, then the vocal folds is, are like this. So when you exercise and exert more energy than usual, the vocal folds are opened wider to allow more air to come in so that you can extract the oxygen that is needed to supply the body during these um, activities. So phonation for speech requires that these arachnoids are rotated by the vocal, by um, uh, intrinsic muscles, and that you will study in detail in anatomy and physiology. And when they are like this, they, these arachnoids are fixated in place. And then beneath the vocal folds, in, the, in this area here, beneath the vocal folds, subglottic pressure, pressure beneath the vocal folds builds up when you bring them together like this. And because the edges of the vocal folds are thin and pliable, stretchy, rubbery, they, the air pressure beneath them, when it reaches a certain level, it blows them apart. So that the vocal folds then, they have elasticity. They want to come back to the midline. So that continuous resistance between the air pressure beneath and the elasticity of the vocal folds, that creates on and off closure, you know, sending away the vocal folds, they come back again. So that creates the cycle of vibration and or the cycle of phonation. And to give you an idea for the adult male, uh, the number of vibration cycles to produce that voice um, is 115 on average. We say, instead of saying 115 vibrations per second or, or cycles per second, we say 150, 115 hertz. For the adult female, 
the vibration rate is 220 or 225 on average. That means that the pitch difference that you hear in the adult female's voice comes from the greater uh, number of vibrations um, uh, during the generation of the voice. So the higher the, the vibration rate, the greater the vibration rate, the higher the pitch. So children, babies, for example, um, newborns, their, vo their vocal folds can vibrate more than 1,200 times per second. So the vibration rate is always in one second. So then we need to know that the vocal folds, the most important functions of the vocal folds are not speech related. The most important functions are biological survival functions. For example, um, when anything goes through the airway um, inadvert inadvertently, for example, like a, a little droplet of water, water or a little piece of food, you notice you'll be sneezing and, and coughing and choking. So what happens is the vocal folds will be closed very, very tightly. And then a lot of pressure builds up beneath them. And all of a sudden, you know, you cough or sneeze, you just open them up very quickly. And that air, increased air pressure beneath them just shoots through and it takes in the way it expels anything that's beneath the vocal folds. So also when you push, for example, you cannot push without, you know, and have a lot of strength without closing the vocal folds. So then, um, and of course, you can imagine, say, uh, giving birth or even using the bathroom, you need to use, you need to, to close the vocal folds tightly to build up that pressure. Then over these functions, we use, uh, we use the same mechanism to generate voice. So voice uh, is produced by using a mechanism that we already use for, for something else. It just happened that can be also used for multiple purposes. This is why we say speech is an overlaid function of the larynx, okay? So it is a secondary function in other words. Um, the vocal folds can be adjusted in various ways. You can adjust their length, make them longer. Um, you can adjust their uh, weight. When you make them longer, you make them thinner and you make them vibrate at a faster rate. All of us experience this once in a while when you are under extreme stress. Let's say you are going um, for an important interview, you notice that you might um, you might be speaking at a higher pitch sometimes or something that is not uh, you are not comfortable with. And some people you can see they can switch into that falsetto mode, and that is because the muscles um, that control the vocal folds um, they kind of you know they tense up <coughs> and they pull up the vocal folds, make them longer, and they switch into a higher pitch. The vocal folds are intricately connected with you know, into uh, or with our emotional system. So they can reflect what condition we are in, what kind of mood we are in. And all of us, uh, we use the vocal, we, I mean, we make tiny adjustments to raise our pitch, to produce um, different kinds of shades of meaning, like to show that you are excited, angry, uh, neutral, not caring, um, and, and so on, bossy. And um, so also um, some vocal folds can take more stress than others. Some vocal folds, some people might use their vocal folds for eight hours, continuously speaking and doing things uh, with little strain. But some people might use their voice for just 45 minutes or one hour. And then you start to, you know, to hear difference, a difference. So they, they you know, people are different in, in how much their vocal folds can uh, tolerate in terms of speaking and activity like that. But um, uh, people like singers, broadcast actors, uh, I mean, broadcasters, actors, uh, professors, teachers, they rely on voice for, for a living. So they, they do a lot of exercises, especially singers, and they go through a lot of training so that they can use that voice in a unique way without uh, stressing the vocal folds or damaging them. So um, let's just get into so the uh, voice disorders and um, survey them. So first, the, there are different kinds of voice, uh, different kinds of problems, many, many kinds of problems that can affect, number one, the structure, number two, and or the function of the vocal folds. Um, so the function will be affected anyways. However, the structure might not always be obvious. You might not see a structural you know, problem on the vocal folds, yet there is uh, abnormal voice. So the vocal folds, these are again, these are 
not normal. I hope that you realize that compare this to, to this, for example, or, or to this. So these vocal folds, um, th there is uh, most of them is just um, edema, you know, swollen uh, tissue that should be removed. And that condition is called Reinke's edema, R-E-I-N-K-E, -E, Reinke's edema, edema. And it is, uh, has another name, Decker's edema. So you can understand now that this is caused by smoking. And that is, um, if the person that, you know, doesn't, I mean, many people who smoke have cancers also, we know that the tobacco inhalation um, can cause 57 different kinds of cancer based on the CDC. So um, edema is not cancerous. However, the person's voice will be, that person will barely be able to talk. And if they speak, they run out of breath very quickly. Their voice is very, very like low pitch and annoying, gravelly and low pitch and harsh and really just painful when you hear that voice. Uh, so that's just an example here of um, what, what kind of a problem that can be caused. I also want to mention that a lot of voice disorders can be prevented and um, some of them are behaviorally related. So um, another example of um, vocal fold problem uh, that can cause vocal fold problem is laryngitis, acute laryngitis. Uh, these problems cause differences in the structure of the vocal fold itself. You need this vocal fold to be uh, smooth at the edges, to, have, to be just normal, just like that, to not to increase in size and so on. But now all of this has to be removed. And then uh, in some cases, Atrophy affects the vocal folds. Atrophy means shrinkage of muscle bulk, decrease in the bulk of the muscle. Um, I'll explain it in two ways or two examples. When uh, adult men, when men um, reach 65, maybe 70 years old, um, generally the muscle bulk all over the body is, is decreased and the vocal folds are two muscles. So the muscle bulk inside of the vocal folds shrinks and as a result, that will raise pitch for this uh, for, for the population of men 70 or, or older. For the adult female, um, it's a different process that results in lowering their pitch. Just because the adult female tends after menopause, uh, tends to accumulate a little bit more tissue on the vocal folds to make them thicker, and that will make them vibrate at a slower rate. So atrophy is the shrinkage or reduction of muscle mass or the shrinkage of tissue. Now we have another cause of kind of voice problem, some, a whole list result from hyperfunctional vocal use. Hyperfunctional means using your voice, say, making your voice louder most of the time. So as you continue yelling, screaming, speaking in a loud voice, that is going to cause a voice uh, disorder. Um, also hyperfunction, uh, there's another term related to, do, to it is called overuse. Like I am speaking now, I am not using the hyperfunctional voice. I'm not yelling, I'm not screaming. Um, but if I continue speaking for like say six hours a day in a row nonstop, I am gonna be overusing my voice. So there's high, uh, problems caused by hyperfunction. There are problems caused by overuse and problems caused by um, misuse. And there are problems caused by hypofunction, like not raising your voice enough, not, um, not tensing them up enough, for example. So decreased muscular activity can also result in, in poor voice performance. When looking at voice quality, there are many different ways to describe voice quality. But before that, when we speak about um, loss of voice, complete loss of voice, that is called aphonia, aphonia. So aphonia is basically whisper, that the person just whispering like this. Why do you whisper? So when you whisper, you are not vibrating the vocal folds. The, the vocal folds are open like this. They come a little bit closer and go back, but they are not completely closed. And that makes just the air streaming through, like puffs of air go in and out, and they are articulated, but they are not, uh, the vocal folds are not really making vibration. So that is called aphonia, loss of vocal fold vibration, loss of voice. <clears throat> then we have many, many ways to describe the quality of the voice itself. Sometimes we, um, we say like fuzzy voice. Sometimes we say raspy voice. Some of these expressions 
they are not just easy to evaluate. So you'll find the whole range of these. However, the, the ones that are most basic include harshness, which means excessive muscular tension. The vocal folds are closed very tightly. And as you, you try, the, the air pressure goes beneath to open them up. There's that mutual resistance that causes that harsh voice. Breathy voice results when the vocal folds are close enough, but the, there are gaps in between that cause air to, to leak you know, through them. And that gives that breathiness. As like someone, so, and then hoarse, hoarseness is both a combination of breathiness, air leaking through, and harshness that results from like tiny kind of a lot of tension between particular areas inside, uh, I mean, uh, along the vocal folds. But also there are a lot of jagged ends and there are um, a lot of spots where air is just leaking out. So both hoarseness means both breathiness and harshness. Uh, please pay attention that the pictures I am using are just examples. I can't add, uh, you know, put images uh, for every single thing, but you can simply just take one of these and plug it into Google Images, and you'll find hundreds and thousands of images for each uh, for each example. So, when we speak uh, again, let's focus a bit on the etiology, on the co causes of vocal voice disorders. There is abuse, vocal abuse. Um, that is, you can best describe it as yelling, shouting, screaming. Um, this, this is what we call, and excessively, like say cheerleading, for example, cheerleaders, they are notorious for voice disorders caused by uh, over uh, excessive um, shouting. And um, so many of them would have, would have um, voice uh, uh, problems caused by uh, what we know as vocal abuse. There's misuse. Misuse is using the voice not in a natural way, like growling, making animal noises, making machine noises and stuff like that, that is misuse. So either one, abuse or misuse will result in uh, vocal fold uh, uh, problems. Um, and then there are uh, other organic, you know, tissue differences that, you know, are classified in your textbook as medical uh, causes. For example, if there is a, a nervous system damage, that could be neurological, like there's paralysis, for example, vocal fold paralysis. That is a neurological, uh, pro, uh, you know, uh, cause. <clears throat> Another organic problem is uh, laryngeal cancer. So as you could see, that vocal fold is not functional at all. And um, uh, the, like, for example, other things are, um, are laryngitis, acute laryngitis. Um, there are cysts and there are um, ulcers. All kinds of problems can, can actually affect the vocal folds. And then there are problems that result from psychological causes where the structures of the vocal folds are completely normal. They look normal, but they are not functioning normally. And, and we call these psychogenic voice disorders. They are emotionally based, caused, uh, attributed to stress uh, or unresolved psychological issues or trauma. So for the psycho psychogenic uh, group of problems, we look at these, um, these um, samples or these categories, I want to, ident to, to point out that there are a lot of categorizations of voice disorders. So you'll find some differences if you use a textbook, um, you know, you'll find some differences um, in the classifications of voice disorders, but we stick to the, the primary ones that most, most authors agree on or most experts agree to. So there's conversion aphonia or dysphonia. Uh, aphonia means lack of phonation, lack of voice, complete loss of voice, the person can only whisper. Dysphonia is that there is voice, but that voice is not normal. Whether that is maybe the pitch is too high, maybe the pitch is too low, maybe the person has hoarseness, maybe. But in any case, the voice is there, but it is nor is not normal. The vocal folds are vibrating on and off, but they are not functioning uh, one you know normally. So, conversion aphonia is a psychologically based disorder resulting from psychological causes. And most of the time, um, there's some kind of stress or trauma. For example, um, someone, uh, there was a case where someone lost um, her father and she was a manager in a company and she got the news that her father passed away. And immediately in the office, she just could not talk and, and she could, could not speak at all. And she stayed for weeks like this um, and then finally, she went to a speech language pathologist and he worked with her within 30 minutes. She was able to get her voice back, but then she was referred immediately to a psychologist who worked with, um, with her on 
exploring you know kind of the the, the cause the psychological trauma that she went through but this kind of treatment um you evaluate the person through doing things that are not speech directly speech related like say cough <coughs> when you cough in order to cough you must have two functional normal vocal folds to make that cough they close close and slam and go away so when the person coughs you know that the vocal folds are working normally um you kind of there are ways to test that the vocal folds are normally functioning and with that there are techniques that we use to enable that person to get the voice back and in many many cases most cases it takes just about 30 minutes and the, you can get the person's voice back but then they need to have a follow-up one follow-up session and then from there they can go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to deal with the underlying causes and there's puberphonia is another example this is a um, uh, particularly affect, affecting uh, males young boys as they transition um, into puberty so the body in the video here that you watch this video a video um the boy's physical body is mature they're completed and yet the voice is not changing he's speaking in, a, in the same boy pitch and that causes a lot of problems in school and the society and psychological a whole range of problems that's called puber phonia puberty and then phonia voice um and again this kind of problem as you could see in the video it just one uh, you do exercises and then one time that he makes his voice boom like this then that means the voice is there it is just a matter of using it in that session and continuing to speak this way and it usually doesn't take more than a couple of therapy sessions so it is um um it, it is easily corrected and then there's muscle tension dysphonia dysphonia is a whole group of them are caused by excessive muscular tension your muscles are part of your body and if you feel stress somewhere the stress is going to just affect other muscles in different areas and the vocal folds are two of the most sensitive muscles as i mentioned they are interconnected you know with uh, um, uh, with our emotional system so we can you can from someone's voice you can detect their mood they can also detect their type of personality like authoritarian or uh, kind of hypo kind of easygoing and so on there is um, the medical group of voice disorders um, i have to mention that mm, these are not always always uh, this is not that like a typical classification that we use to this to refer them to as medical voice disorders all voice disorders are medical disorders but um in any case um even the psychogenic they are psychiatric problems so as a matter of fact the voice uh center in the massachusetts uh, no, uh, eye, ear, nose, and throat, um, uh, uh, medicine, ear, ear, nose, and throat, um, uh, medicine de department, they have a voice psychiatrist there. <clears throat> so anyways, um, we tend to refer to, to these problems as neurological or organic. So paralysis of the vocal folds uh, is a neurological problem. And in this image, you could see that this vocal fold on your right side, that is the patient's left vocal fold so um that vocal fold is paralyzed and the other one is, is healthy so what they do is they tend to inject the paralyzed vocal fold make it bigger uh, inject it with the botox and make it bigger so that this vocal fold can can reach it as it vibrates as you could see this right vocal fold it has traveled as far as it can so that cannot go beyond that but this one is not doing its part it has to it should be traveling to come to the middle and seal this gap as a result it is fixed in place it doesn't move at all it's paralyzed because of a stroke so they have to inject it make it bigger and when it comes to me this one will be fixated in that position and and this vocal fold obviously is going to go back when the person stops um stops uh, speaking so that vocal fold will be going back and forth but this one will not be so vocal fold paralysis uh, most of the time luckily most of the time uh, affects one side and it is the most common cause is um damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve the, the nerve that controls vocal fold um, muscles and also the muscles that control little the intrinsic muscles that move the arenoids so that uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve branches off the vagus nerve which is cranial nerve number 10 coming out of the brain stem and many people who most often when they have uh, open heart surgery because that that the recurrent laryngeal nerve passes it's underneath here and comes up again to connect them to the larynx uh, during uh, open heart surgery that could be affected could be even cut uh, or damaged 
And then there is spasmodic dysphonia. There are uh, two videos here that show you ex examples of these dysphonias, which is uh, like a strangled voice. <coughs> and uh, it is a rare disease, uh, to one to two cases uh, in, in 10,000 people. And uh, deep areas of the brain called basal ganglia are affected, and that, uh, that causes this disorder. There is adductor spasmodic dysphonia, which means the, the vocal folds are pushing too tightly as the person is trying to talk, and that causes a strangulated kind of voice quality. And they give a botulinum toxin um, injection in order to relieve that tension. There's also adductor, I mean, abductor um, spasmodic dysphonia, which is the opposite. So there are several kinds. Again, we are just sampling them. Um, there are vocal fold problem, I mean, um, behavioral problems that result in organic changes in the structure of the vocal folds. For example, um, contact ulcers can be caused by uh, like this in the back of the back of the vocal folds next to the arytenoid cartilages. Um, when the person just yells or screams or uh, speaks in a kind of domineering, aggressive voice, uh, this two areas push hard against each other and slam hard against each other. And they cause these little ulcers. And usually over time, even if you have one in one side, it hits the other side and it creates another side here. So it will be like that. And that is typically caused by um, aggressive, an aggressive voice by an um, vocal, vocal abuse, shouting, screaming. Um, when this is not caused by vocal abuse um, and it is caused by, um, it can be caused by, um, by intubation um, it has a different name uh, but um, when, in some cases when someone goes into surgery and they put a tube here to, to, trick, to, to um, make the person breathe and then over time you take that tube out it can cause irritation here it exposes that tissue and that is, starts to build up something like this so that can can, can happen as a result of uh, intubation uh, but most often uh, definitely when when you say contact ulcers it refers to the behavioral kind uh, people who um, who uh, continue to like cough very hardly, I mean very strongly. Um, sometimes also um, GERD can can cause these ulcers. The the fluid leaks from the esophagus and and it just it comes here and it burns this tissue and it can cause uh, you know the reflux can cause these ulcers as well. And then we um, in terms of vocal uh, abuse also, it can cause vocal nodules. So vocal nodules, um, they result from excessive talking. They result from uh, a hyperfunctional voice, yelling, screaming, shouting, and, and prolonged use of the voice. And the middle area here between the, like, like basically at the end of the anterior one third, like if you measure the vocal, let's go back here. If you measure the vocal folds from the front to the back, divide them into three pieces. So that will be the anterior one third. In the border between the anterior one third and the, pus, and the, and the middle one third, here, this area receives like a greater impact when you, you know, open and close the vocal folds together. And that is where uh, vocal nodules typically originate. So the person might have one, but then very soon they will have another one because as they slam again on the other side, then you have two here. And as you could see, that produces that kind of hourglass uh, configuration where even though the vocal folds are able to, to touch at the site where there is um, there is that nodule, then they cannot close on the other side. And that causes leaking of air. And that we hear this as breathiness. So these are vocal nodules. They, if the person uh, abuses voice just once or twice, they this can go away. But if that is a behavior that continues, then they will become callous. They become hardened and more tissue builds upon them and the person has to have surgery. But the surgery will not be effective unless the behavior is changed. This is why if you, you refer um, to the ear, nose and throat uh, doctor, you refer a case, immediately they say, give us a plan, tell us we want to make sure the person can control that behavior that caused the problem in the first place so that the, the problem doesn't come back again. In terms of polyps, polyps um, can occur because of a lot of reasons. They're like blister-like growths. And most of the time they tend to be unilateral. Um, they will affect the weight of the vocal fold and they have different locations where they can, can be on top of the vocal fold, on the side, beneath, they have different, um, but definitely they will affect the vibration rate <coughs> of the vocal fold. And, um, and again, uh, if they stay too long, they might need to be surgically removed. 
Some of them are acute and they, they could go away if the cause is removed. So they occur in about 10% of the population. In terms of carcinoma, that's a different name for cancer. And we know there are about 8 million deaths per year in the world caused by cancer, I think, smoking. And a significant percentage of this, I don't recall, but I recall uh, maybe 2 million of these are not smokers, but they inhale secondhand smoke. And as a result, they get the disease as well and they die from it. So people who smoke are not just um, damaging their own health. They are damaging uh, the health of people around them and damaging the health of their children, their spouses, their, the people who live with them in the household or the people who get exposed to that. Um, we call it passive smoking or secondhand smoke. There's even um, research on thirdhand smoke. What happens when you buy a car that was used by a smoker? You still get exposure. You go to a hotel, you use the same sheets of a smoker. That's thirdhand smoking. And research does show that there is an effect as well. Not as great as secondhand smoking. But anyways, uh, this affects 11,000 cases in the United States every year. 75% um, uh, you know, affect the vocal fold itself, like the cancer hits the vocal fold itself. And in that case, uh, the whole larynx, most of the cases, the whole larynx is removed because that is going to spread anyways. So to give the person a better chance, they would take usually take the whole larynx away to, to avoid uh, the chances of the cancer recurring or coming back. <coughs> so um, 15 to 20% of the cases require laryngectomy. Um, there are many ways. The voice evaluation is a very complicated process, and um, it has many pieces as well. The, it is best conducted by two, two specialists, the speech-language pathologist and the ear, nose, and throat physician, otherwise known as uh, otolaryngologist or otorhinolaryngologist. So the voice evaluation has two pieces to it. One piece is called the perceptual voice eval, and that is a lot of this is performed by the speech language pathologist and the other part is instrumental and in many cases uh, the instrumental also the, the speech pathologist is <clears throat> qualified uh, to perform the um, the instrumental however to do that instrumentally you have to be either in a medical facility like a hospital where you can have the equipment like you see here this equipment is very expensive and um uh, or also in a doctor's office, ear, nose, and throat doctor. Commonly, there are many speech pathologists who work in a physician's office where they have the equipment and they work together with the physician to diagnose and to treat the voice uh, disorder. So, um, in some cases, you work with an um, with someone gastroenterologist because, as I mentioned, uh, acid reflux does damage the vocal folds. So, if the, there's a cause, you can work with the um, with the expert in that regard. Um, and there's a whole voice team. So the voice evaluation requires an interview so you can evaluate perceptually based on your hearing, based on what you could see on the neck and the way the person uses his or her voice. You can see you do the perceptual evaluation based on what you feel the voice is like. Then you do an instrumental evaluation of using instruments. Uh, we also make a determination on the quality of the voice. We determine is that voice, um, for example, dysphonic, is it uh, harsh, is it, and so on. We ask the, the person to evaluate, to kind of rate his or her own voice, and the, the uh, history, uh, medical history is very important in that regard as well. The instrumental evaluation um, involves visualizing the vocal folds. You can do this in two different ways. The first way is to uh, the first way is uh, to do um, stroboscopy stroboscopy evaluation, which you, you put the camera inside of the mouth directly and you visualize the vocal folds from above. And then the person can would say sounds like ah, uh, e, he, but they cannot talk, they cannot sing, for example. Then we have the, we have the um, endoscopy assessment where the camera is inserted into the nasal, um, in the, into the nose, and it goes to the back of the throat and it looks at on top of the of the vocal folds the person can talk and do everything normally in that case but the procedure is invasive before 2010 speech language pathologists were not allowed to perform that procedure however in 2010 asha with uh, advocacy and and lobbying we were able to get uh, approved to perform these procedures as speech language pathologists the reason before was that the the you would require um, to spray the nasal cavity with anesthesia and anesthesia requires approvals and all of this but because the person would work in a hospital anyways or a medical facility they would have access to the anesthesia and they can perform the endoscopy 
and um, totally, you know, fine. Um, so we are we are um, qualified to perform that, and uh, we just need to to have uh, access to the equipment. And there's a busy pitch. It's a system, computerized system. When you, you, you do a lot of speaking tasks through that, it measures your pitch, your loudness, it measures the airflow, and a lot of information you get from that, that will be part of the instrumental evaluation. And then you put all of that together and evaluate your results and kind of reach a diagnosis. And then from there, you decide on what kind of treatment you will um, utilize. <coughs> and, um, in terms of therapy, there are many, many methods out there. I have uh, added here some videos that give you just examples of the techniques that we use. And so, for example, counseling as speech language pathologists, counseling for us means informing the patient about his or her uh, problem and giving suggestions or discussing that you know, problem with the caregivers, for example say, this is what the problem is, this is the best course, so, you know, so that is all counseling, giving them strategies and things like that. Uh, so uh, we do this if the person has a stress-related problem, uh, we teach them how to breathe, how to, for example, uh, take care of their voice. One example of counseling, for example, is when the person has, uh, is a vocal abuser, for example, or let's say nothing, um, Let's say a child who's 10 years old and is in sports and just yells and screams across the field and is always like uh, uh, using his voice uh, in a hyperfunctional way. Then we, we ask as part of the counseling process, we give a program and say, this is a vocal hygiene program. This is what this child should be doing. Definitely should not be raising his voice. We give them techniques, you know, instead of yelling and screaming, just go closer to the person and speak at a closer range. Avoid this, avoid that, drink a lot of water and, and so on. It's a whole complete program. That is part of counseling. Then there's ear training. Um, we, that is also kind of, they listen to different kinds of voices. Their own voice is the best one in that regard where they can evaluate it, you know, compared to other voices. Uh, we listen to them and give them feedback, uh, how much improvement they have made. And, and we evaluate the videos that they, we make with them, for example. Um, sometimes uh, if you increase loudness for some people, that will improve the problem if they're not, they not loud enough. If they are, you decrease loudness, you improve the, you make their voice better. So it depends. Loudness adjustment can, can work um, either way. There's a yawn and unsigned technique. Uh, this video will demonstrate it for you. Oh, and then you kind of yawn and then sigh. So you kind of release that yawn into a sigh. And that is supposed to be relaxing the neck muscles, extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. When you relax, in that case, if the person has, uh, you know, stress or a higher pitch that's unjustified, you can just bring it back. But there's the open mouth approach where you can say to the person, uh, imitate like have like a stack of cookies or a, or a double burger, open your mouth, open your mouth big, and then you vocalize, say certain sounds. So as you speak, you open your jaw more. And as you do that, it takes off the stress from the lower structures. So there's also respiration training, inhalation, exhalation, and so on. That's to regulate airflow so that you can build up just sufficient tension beneath the vocal folds to enable you to vocalize, to make your voice loud enough or, or, or to control that loudness by decreasing the tension and the pressure beneath the vocal folds. In the case um, of uh, laryngeal cancer, as I explained, uh, many people would have laryngectomy. And what that, that means is that the larynx is taken out completely and then there is a valve that is put to close the hole here, the stoma. And that valve is called, um, uh, I mean, tracheoesophageal, uh, I'm sorry, um, a tracheoesophageal puncture sometimes uh, is used attached to this valve where uh, the, there is a, a little opening between, this, between the stoma, between the here, and into the pharynx. So if the person wants to speak, uh, he or she can just put their thumb on, on the valve and it will trap the air and it will circulate it through the oral cavity and they can speak. But the voice, of course, will be very different. Also, people can use uh, an artificial larynx called electro larynx. And there are many advanced ones nowadays. So there's a video here that shows you um, how you know, someone uses it. And there's also one to show the tricky esophageal speech. That is not very common, but they still use it in Massachusetts and it's effective for some people. So we have discussed um, the generation of voice, how voice is generated. We looked into um, 
to different causes and do different sample different kinds of voice disorders and the diagnosis and the treatment. And again, when you go to grad school, you're going to have a, a complete course, three credit course focusing on voice and voice disorders. Lastly, I want to say that treatment of voice disorders is one of the most amazing, the most fulfilling um, uh, kind of uh, things you can do as a professional. Uh, it is a medical solidly inside in the medical you know arena you you know you work in hospitals you work with medical professionals and voice could be your passion could be the only thing that you want to do in life um it has many uses uses of course um in private practice you can do it however in, you might not have enough patients to to run just one whole practice on voice you would have to to kind of see more kinds of cases um like articulation language and so on in addition Okay, that's it. And thank you um, for watching the video. I hope that you found it helpful.